When we come to man we have suggested that the scenario provided by planetary directions affords us variety of situations, challenges, and interactions by which human life is enriched far beyond the necessities of survival. We must realize that evolution for man is such that survival of the fittest, whether or not adequate to account for animal evolution, has no bearing on man, no relevance to human evolution. Man's evolution is that of each individual person, not of the species. Each person lives his life, learns his lesson, and gradually through many lifetimes, increases his scope and competence. This gain is not transmitted to his offspring, nor is it stored. As with higher animals in the group soul, since man's task is to individuate, to stand clear of the group soul and learn to think and act on his own initiative. Not only is it important in this connection that human behavior does not affect the genes, that is, there is no inheritance of characteristics acquired by the parent, but even if there were such inheritance it would not operate after the childbearing age, often the most rewarding part of a person's life. Life begins at 40, it has been said, and I think it's true. Until about this age we are gathering experience which we can only begin to use after 40. The duration of the lifespan fits perfectly with the periods of the planets, and if it does not afford a confirmation of their influence, at least it provides, as we said, a way to define their influence, Uranus, with its period of 84 years, defining the longest cycle of change that can be encompassed within the life expectancy of a healthy person. Neptune, with double that period, correlating with the unconscious, and so on. But, it's time we stopped borrowing bits and pieces from this ancient science of astrology. I feel rather guilty, in fact, about this borrowing. Like a person who takes the limestone facing from the Great Pyramid to construct modern buildings, or columns from a Greek temple to erect a railroad station, I have borrowed from the zodiac the concepts for the construction of the geometry of meaning, from the table of houses the concept of kinds of relationship not possible to consider in science, such as that to an equal and that to what is above oneself, and I've borrowed from the planets for the definition of the powers which characterize the stages of process. Because of the disrepute into which astrology has fallen in modern times, I omitted reference to the subject in my first book. I hope to show the same conclusions from a candid appraisal of the sweep of evolution plus arguments from first principles. On the other hand, when I do claim the authority of astrology I am told that the subject does not support my interpretation. The double bind reminds me of how Chinese artists in the past used to follow the manner of more ancient artists to lend prestige to their own work, while modern artists go out of their way to invent an original style. To add to the confusion we have parapsychologists following the protocol of science to gain credibility. I think I understand the intelligent reader's hesitancy about astrology, and I share with my reader an even greater bias against religion, at least insofar as the church has distorted Christ's teachings. On the other hand I want to share with my reader the disenchantment I have come to, by long study, with the credo of science, which I come increasingly to realize is at odds with its own findings. Science has been the great venture of modern man, but I am deeply disappointed that it has stopped short of its goal. It has become political, adhering to a materialist dialectic. The cult of calibration and Measurement has dispensed with consideration of first principles and produced tons of facts tied together with bits of fragile string. The consistency and clarity, even of classical determinism, has been lost and its blundering prejudice retained. The stimulating challenge of ESP is ignored and made ridiculous. Even the 19th century recognition that perception was only partially 
based on sensation and had components of value and image carried over from earlier experience, is set aside in obeisance to a reductionism based on a physics long since obsolete. Science, in short, is a motley of fragmented special disciplines, each encrusted with its own jargon and incomprehensible to its fellows, rallying under a common policy of objectivity, valid enough as applied to methods but downright misleading when applied as it is and without justification to require that the world be exclusively objective and physical, this despite the recognized fact that the fundamental particles are without identity and the photon, so ubiquitous in that it is the source of all changes in matter, chemical, atomic, and otherwise, is not recognized for its primary role, and is non-objective, impossible to observe. When I then find that the most fundamental entity in physics, the quantum of action, more basic even, as a Wheeler says, then particles or fields of force or space and time themselves is non-physical. Non-objective, should I remain silent? I can at least say so and leave the layman to draw his own conclusions.